So one of the cars we're finally getting back to, it's been a little while, is our 1970 Dodge Challenger Vanishing Point Tribute Car. Now we started this car a few years ago, got behind on all the other cars that are here, so it did go a bit on the back burner. I'm excited because it's my favorite tribute car. I mean, I'd love to do a Dirty Mary Crazy Larry someday and some of the other cars that maybe even a Back to the Future car. But for movie cars, Christine, Vanishing Point, they're my two tops. It takes me back, you know, to when I was a kid when my uncle worked out at the Motor View Drive-In. I saw that at the Motor View Drive-In, I'm gonna guess it was around 1975 or so, with a double feature with Bullet. So my car fan, movie fans at home will appreciate that. I just fell in love with the car. So I'm excited to be able to build an accurate tribute to that car. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Buried deep in the Pacific Northwest. One team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible. Finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman. His cousin, Doug. His daughter, Alyssa. His best friend, Royal. His painter, Will. His assembly tech, Justin. And the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring resurrecting and recreating some of the fastest, fiercest, and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. When I talk about an accurate tribute, I'm talking about every conceivable detail. Kowalski's car was a 70 Challenger, the camera car. 70 Challenger RT, 444 speed. They made 916 of these cars. Alpine white EW1, it was a pretty basic car that they rented from Dodge when they did this. No shaker hood or anything cool like that. It was a four speed. All Challenger RTs got a rally instrument cluster, so it had that. But it had the poverty mirror, the standard base mirror. It did have through the pan exhaust, 15.7 rallies on it. You can see those really good in a couple of shots. Every conceivable detail on this build, other than the vehicle identification number, will tell you it is Kowalski's 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. According to the director of the film Vanishing Point, it was 20th Century Fox's studio executive, Richard Zanuck, who came up with the idea of using the brand new 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. Featuring the Challenger center stage, endeavored to return the favor for Chrysler providing Fox with rental cars for only a dollar a day. Five Alpine white Dodge Challenger RTs were lent to the production. Four were equipped with manual 440s and the fifth was geared with an automatic 383. Vanishing Point premiered in January of 1971 and director Steven Spielberg named it as one of his favorite films. When I first started this project, I had the idea of building five of them. One I was gonna keep for myself, the other ones I was going to sell. This is the very, very first one that's being finished at Graveyard Cars. Again, turning back the clocks just a little bit, one of the first things we built out for this car was the engine. Now, I had rounded up, because I told you it's gonna be correct in every conceivable detail, an F. 440 HP block. Not the numbers one, because this car started life as a slant six. So I found a correct date coded 440 HP engine and we sent it out, had the machine work done, brought it back. And that was an opportunity at that point, this goes back to the earlier days of Alyssa being here on the show and working in the shop, that I wanted her to have some experience assembling that engine. So I let her work with the guys on building out the engine. It was a great experience building out the engine for the Vanishing Point tribute car. I mean, this is the first time I've had experience like that. I've never been able to actually build out an engine, so that was great. Prior to this, if you would have asked me <laughs> the order of assembly for a 440 Magnum, I would have had no clue. But now I can tell you correctly. So what's the first step? Like, what are we doing right now? Right now they're putting in the bearings, the main bearings. First, we start off with removing the main caps, installing the new bearings in the block, and applying assembly grease. And then we set the crankshaft down into place. After the rear main seals and crankshaft are sitting in place, next we replace the main cap bearings and install them and torque everything down to specifications. Do you remember what the tension specs on the main bearings are? So first off, it's not tension specs. It's called feet-pounds of torque. The main bearings are 85 pounds. 
The rod bearings are 45 pounds and the cylinder heads are 70 pounds. Do you want to know the rest of them? Oh no, that, that'll do. Once the crankshaft is in place and torqued down, the next thing is to install the rings on the pistons and install the pistons in the engine. This was the hardest part for me. I couldn't get the ring compressor to stop sliding off, so the guys had to give me a hand. When you have the pistons in the cylinder and the rod butted against the crankshaft, you install the rod caps to the bearings and then torque them to spec. I'm so excited to see the Vanishing Point Challenger finally getting worked on. It's been a long time since I've seen the movie, but it was definitely a favorite of mine. Mark and I both love watching Kowalski row through the gears in a Hemi four-speed. This is gonna be really cool. Once all the pistons and rods are installed, the next part is the camshaft and lifters and timing chain and gears. On the big block, the oil pump goes on the outside of the block versus the small block where it's internal. The next thing to install are the cylinder head gaskets and heads. Some of the bolts from the head actually go through spark plug wire separators. So make sure these are in place before you torque the heads down. The last things we install are the rocker shaft, the intake manifolds, oil pan, valve covers, and exhaust manifold. After we had the engine assembly built, we put it on our engine run stand, moved it outside. Always want to test her on these things, make sure you don't have any leaks or drips or weird noises. And it fired right up. It sounded really good. Oh, got a little something going on. Oh, look at that. The engine fires right up and sounds great. So that's the good news. But the bad news is every time an engine starts, my dad has to embarrass me. Mick Jagger. Oh, here we go. I think he was doing Start Me Up by the Rolling Stones this time. So there's two things I don't like. One is obviously reveals, and we've covered that. The second one is Mark's dancing. It's not like he comes out and he's a good dancer. He's ridiculous. He's got no talent, no skills, and nobody's learned how to handle Mark. If you don't laugh or you don't engage, it just stops. But all the guys that work here laugh, engage, and join in with him, and he thinks he's being funny, then before you know it, half my crew's dancing, and they look ridiculous. Good response. So the little car that we're building our vanishing point out of started life as a C engine code. That represented the 225 cubic inch slant six. This was just a little EK2 vitamin C orange six cylinder three speed manual on the floor car. So like with all of our cars, we disassembled it, inventoried everything, sent it out and had it dipped. When it came back, it did have a lot more problems with it than what I thought it was gonna have, a lot more sheet metal damage. A lot of stuff needed to be replaced. So I had Will go ahead and do the DP90 on it because we were gonna jump right on it afterwards. DP90 keeps it safe from humidity while you're waiting to work on it. That was several years ago and it got pushed out into the rain. So DP90 isn't designed to be out in the weather and out in the elements. It's a substrate. It has to be top coated. With nothing, it just rusts. And that's what happened. Everything between the wells, between the panels, all of that stuff started rusting on it. And we started getting peek through rust in our DP90. Here's the problem. Our dipper, although they can take paint off of a 50 year old car like nobody's business, it won't touch that DP90. Chemically, it won't touch it. You could send it over there and it'll come back looking exactly the same as it did. So it had to have an abrasive stripping, media blasting. The 1970 Challenger. This car makes the scene like a bolt from the blue. For a lot of people, Challenger is the dream come true. For folks who want a mill that breezes along smooth, quiet, and at minimum cost, there's a standard Challenger 6, the 225. From here, the offerings go right on up to stormers like this 440 Magnum six-pack and the 426 Hemi. Both are available on Challenger RT. So's this shaker hood. The 318 is standard in V8 models. The 383 Magnums in RTs. Hotter V8s are available in both series. Now, typically around here, if we need to blast something, media blast something, 
it's a small area. Maybe got a little bit of surface rust around the hinge. We can use our small spot blaster, this cool little handheld unit that holds sand in it. It's basically a siphon feed setup, but you can't blast a whole car with that. So I ended up calling the guys that make the other equipment that we use. They make good media cabinets and we use their stuff and have for years. So when I reached out, I just told them what we were working on. I knew we couldn't use like a cabinet, a regular cabinet style. It had to be something free held. Something mobile would be nice because we're going all over the place here. We're out in the field, we're over here, we're doing spots. And he says, oh yeah, yeah, I got the uh, 4260-2799009 uh, Alpha New Air. And it's all these, I don't care. It's not a Mopar, right? Just send me something I can blast the car with. And he did. He sent me an incredibly large, self-contained, amazing piece of equipment that would be awesome if I had any air to run it. That's the part I kind of left out, or perhaps he left out. I tried to hook it to my compressor. I thought, well, I'll just go out there and hook up my compressor. Doesn't work that way. Had to get a bigger compressor. Called our other guys, the ones that make our compressors in here. I said, hey, I'm working on the um, 97,262 Seas Into the Future, amazing piece of equipment. Oh, yeah, yeah, you need 42,674 Echo Bravo Juliet 16. I don't know, I don't care. In fact, why don't both you guys get on the phone and you come out here and show me what I need because I don't understand any of it. We have a number of different diesel mobile air machines, is what we call them. All right, so uh, to start the machine, yep. basically the first thing you need to do is turn on the main power. There's just a button right in here. Got it. A little simple switch. Click that up. Two position switch. Copy. And you open that up, it's got a little computer, so it's gonna boot up. So the thing is, it, it does take a little bit of learning. It's simple once you learn how to do it, but you gotta know what buttons to push, right? Like oh, Henry Ford on the assembly line, knowing what button to push. And now you're just gonna engage the starter and start the unit. Yes. Okay. okay. I'm a little Sorry. scared of the engine, so I like and to step back. <laughs> <laughs> but I would have loved to have this equipment years ago. So Mark, this is our wet blast system. What makes it so cool is it can blast wet or dry. So you can take right. it out. If you need to blast something small part and you just want to blast dry, you can do that. Or if you're out all day long and you want to suppress that dust, you can do that with Fantastic. the wet blast system. That's a great, that's good for us. Because every once in a while, it is just a small little thing, but too big for the little shop, the little handheld. Guy. Sure. So that's, that's perfect for that. And then the wet one would be, I assume, much more environmentally friendly. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Right. Yep, that's what it's for. If I would have had this 20 years ago, I wouldn't have had to send them down and had them blasted like we did over the years where you can't control anything. The Daytona is back now, and we've got it inside the shop up on the correct rotisserie so we can start replacing panels. Okay, so the firewall looked to me like it was fine. Now that the Daytona is stripped, we can really see what all's wrong with it. Um, it's always one of the things that you bite your nails a little when you send something out to get stripped because so much paint, so much epoxy, sealers, primers, Bondo, all kinds of things mask the true condition of the metal. Uh, I'm gonna move it back over to the body shop so they can start drilling out all the spot welds and removing sheet metal. Having your own unit, and you know that when you blast it, you don't want to get in the middle of a panel and warp it. If you're doing it yourself, you can control all that. So it's just one of those great examples of, we've been talking about it all the way since season one about having good vendors and good, good people who appreciate your plight and make the equipment to help you do better. Great partners of what it's all about. That's why we're able to do some of the things now that we were never able to do before. After everything was set up and I figured out how to work it, they brought this cool suit out. I love it. I always tell everybody, I want to know how a piece of equipment works before I send it out to the shop and have them work on it. Because I don't want any complaints. I don't want somebody coming up and saying, oh, this doesn't work. Well, it does. You just don't know what you're doing. So I had them show me exactly how to do it. They put me in my little suit, which, I, again, is my favorite thing. It's like a little spaceman. I'm out there blasting around. Then you kind of feel it, right? This thing's working. You know how it is when an engine runs? I get excited. So I bust a couple of moves. It's, it's, it's my space suit. It's so nice to be able to do that quickly and have it all under your control. Like I say, great equipment makes a great finished product. Great blasting suits make a great bit. If you watch me in that bit, I, I'm Michael Jackson in, in, a moon, in a moon suit, man. That's what I am. I'm Michael Jackson in a moon suit dancing. You're Moonwalker. I am Moonwalker. So the nice thing is we got all the blasting done out there in the field, got rid of all that rust that had begun to accumulate. After that, we could blow it out, get every ounce of media out of the car, move it into Will's department, and I had him re-DP90 the car. 
After that, we were able to move it into the metal shop where they could begin assessing what panels need to be replaced and begin that process. So on this car, as I had mentioned, we ended up replacing a lot of sheet metal on it. One of the big things is the main floor. Even though it wasn't just completely rotted through, it had enough peppering in it that we wanted to replace that one piece. You got to drill out all the spot welds, cut it loose from the rockers anywhere it's not spot welded at. Take your time and dissect that panel out. If you get the panel out clean, you can treat, clean everything underneath it, prep it for the new panel installation. Because some of the areas on our underfloor and seat panel aren't accessible to our spot welder, we use a combination of welds. Some of them are spot welds, just like the factory does. For other ones, we use plug welds in the MIG welder. It's a lot of work, but when it's done, it comes out beautiful. You can't tell that that's not a brand new Chrysler part installed in that car. And the same thing on the under seat pan. There's a lot of thinking and fitting before you can start welding. Because there's a certain way things are layered, there's a lot of thought and attention to fitting. When you do it right, the panel goes in easily and fits nice and tight. The panel gets a combination of spot welds and MIG welds. This is the Challenger two-door hardtop. There are five other models. A long, low, and lively Challenger convertible. The Challenger RT two-door hardtop. The Challenger RT convertible. A special edition Challenger two-door hardtop. A formal coupe. The SE model is an optional package and includes a vinyl roof with a small formal rear window. Completing the model lineup is the Challenger RT Special Edition, two-door hardtop. This wood grain rally cluster is standard on the RT, optional on the Challenger. It adds a tack, clock, oil pressure gauge, and trip odometer. And of course, the automatic transmission. When it's mounted on the optional console, it has a speed gate to channel the action. Torque flight and four-speed manual are optional on all models. Floor-mounted, heavy-duty, full-sync, three-speed is standard with most engines. So in case of our 73 Challenger, this car shows up and it's supposed to be ready for body and paint. We get the car, it is completely packed full of parts, which is cool if they're usable parts. Most of them weren't usable at all. But not only that, this car was supposed to be ready for the body work to be done and go right to paint. Clearly not the case at all. So you don't know what you're getting when you restore these cars until it comes back from the dipper. In this particular case, the car comes back and you see all the previous sins that had been done on the car before. The whole car, all the metal work had been done, but none of it was good. So between the metal work being poor, the thing was filled with rust holes. So this car was literally starting at ground zero. So the first thing wrong is the core support had been replaced, but it wasn't even put back in the right location. The inner fenders, they were welded on in the wrong place. And on top of that, they were arc welded on. It was so far gone the wrong direction, it had welds where there shouldn't even be welds. We had to replace all of the metal. And then the customer, halfway through the build, decides, hey, I want air conditioning. I get it, why not? The problem with that is you gotta replace the firewall. You know, the front rails and the rear rails had been ripped out, damaged, unusable, so we had to replace those also. We could go on for days about how many issues this car has, but you get the gist of it. If it had any metal work done, we had to go back and redo it. Well, Will's 100% right on this car, it was a mess. Not only the things that still needed to be replaced, like the doors and the fenders, they were rotted out too but the work that had been done on it all had to be redone. So it was an enormous task for the metal shop, but they did do a great job. They got it done and were able to move it right out to the mudroom. 
Now, just to refresh your memory, this is the car that Will and you, my director, stabbed me in the back on. What'd you say? Will pulled all the tape off the paint before he started. How would you even know that? I filmed it. This is the one where I went in and I made all my marks on the car of little things that needed to be addressed, and Will just blew it off and says, I don't care about any of that stuff, I'm just gonna paint the car. Well, it, in spite of all the things that happened, it did come out very, very nice. That's kind of where we're at right now. The body and the paint is all done on the car, it's gorgeous, of course it is, we're graveyard cars. We're ready to install the drivetrain. Now before we do that, this owner has requested a Magnum Force front suspension in it, which you guys hear us talking about all the time. But I wanted to show you what the intricate difference are between an OEM, at least some of the components of an OEM front suspension came member and that rack and pinion Magnum Force setup. So this is the stock OEM upper control arm. This is the right hand side. You can see it's got quite a bit of shape to it. It uses a ball joint. This little critter right here bolts into place and it screws down. It would take these upper control arm bushings that go into these round holes here. It gets pressed in, this one will get pressed into there. Once that's done, and this was in the car, these little eccentric bolts would go in here like this, and there's a little horseshoe-shaped thing inside the car. So when it hits it, it pushes the cam away. See how that's moving there? But that little bit of adjustment both ways is all you have with a stock control arm. Okay, so we're talking about front end alignments here. Everybody's heard the term, gotta have the car aligned. Car alignment points, certainly back in these days, today some of these are not even an adjustable point. But back in this day, you could adjust the caster, the camber, and the toe in. The cam bolts that Chrysler put in, they don't have a lot of movement to them. There's a little bit, maybe a half of an inch. Whereas you go to the Magnum Force setup, it uses a joint, a heim joint I believe it's called, that unscrews, I mean, two inches if you want it to. Those things go a long way into these tubular control arms. So now the distance from here to here is what, an inch more. And I could go another inch if I wanted to. Same thing over here. We have the full ability to adjust this upper control arm both directions as much as we want. Now, instead of being stuck with maybe the most you could get is a half a degree or one degree of caster, you can now get three or four degrees of caster. And what you know if you're driving the car down the road that you have lots of caster, you know how when you come out of a, a turn and you let go of the steering wheel or you just kind of allow it to correct itself, you don't have to sit there and force it back, right? You let go of the wheel and it kind of corrects itself, that's controlled by the amount of caster. So if you don't have very much, you have to give it a little assist to get it back to neutral. If you let go of that wheel in a full turn and it goes back to center, you got a lot of caster. If you've been paying attention, you should know if this trivia is true or false. The new 1970 Challenger is available in five specific models. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. Welcome back. Do you know if this statement is true, or did you just take a guess? The new 1970 Challenger is available in five specific models. If you guess true, then I've got bad news for you. The answer is false. And you would know that if you were listening carefully. There were actually six specific models for the Challenger in 1970. The Challenger two-door hardtop along with five other additional models. The long, low, and lively Challenger convertible. The Challenger RT two-door hardtop. The Challenger RT convertible the Special Edition Challenger two-door hardtop, and the Challenger RT Special Edition two-door hardtop. In addition, the Challenger came with beautiful bucket seats. This is the standard interior for all models. And to shed some light at road level, the 14-inch wheels and 70 series tires are standard with all but the 340 or Hemi engines. With them, you get the wider 6015s with raised white letters. Nobody's ever gonna convince me to like the aftermarket new stuff more than my original. I'm just an OG guy, I like my OG cars, I like my OG suspension. That's original gangster, in case some of you guys don't know what that means. Quarter, quarter in the soft food. Waiting for the dial tone. Oh. Anywho, I do still appreciate 
the aftermarket technology. I appreciate guys like Ron who have taken a wheel and made it roll smoother and faster and better. Just doesn't necessarily fit every application in the world. But when you want that, that's a great system to go with. This one, Ron has moved all the steering in front of the engine. All right. On this one here, you see that the steering, which I haven't even shown you yet, is behind the engine. Everything is back here. You go over to this one, everything is in front. This is our rack and pinion steering. This is our sway bar. Notice the diameter of the sway bar. We're talking about an inch and a quarter sway bar right there. Polyurethane bushings. So now the stability of that front end is about five times more rigid, just guessing, than an OEM one. The main thing is, since the steering is in the front and it's rack and pinion, it's more sure-footed. So here, I show you our steering gear. You see what that looks like. Over here, our new steering gear, which is a rack and pinion unit. The handling and the sure-footed nature of this geometry is so much superior to the factory stock one. This is an integral style steering. So it uses the big power steering box compared to that little bitty one I just showed you a second ago that's part of the actual rack and pinion. This thing takes up a lot more real estate, which when installing these makes it more difficult. Out of this gear, to make up what that little rack and pinion does all by itself, we have a pitman arm coming off of the bottom of the steering gear. We have an idler arm on the other side. It has what you call a drag link. The drag link connects the pitman arm, the idler arm, to the tie rod ends, the inner tie rod ends, which are these right here. Then it goes through the tie rod sleeve. This is adjustable. This is how I set my toe in. That will make those wheels open and close. This is an outer tie rod end right here. That fastens to the lower ball joint. The lower ball joint and this control arm are one piece. They bolt to the knuckle, the upper control arm goes onto it, and that is the geometry of your entire front end. But because of all these joints, there's a lot of room for play in there. Whereas on our rack and pinion, you don't have nearly as much. You have the rack and pinion, outer tie rod ends, an adjustment sleeve, and you're done. This is our lower control arm. If you look at the width of it, I would put that at about three inches wide. This has the ability to flex, especially when you have a 4,000 pound car on it, pulling it one direction or the other. If this bar wasn't here, this strut rod, and you were to hit the brakes, the tire would stop the car and keep moving, and this thing, because it's so narrow, would flex back like this. It'd be dangerous, so they put these strut rods in. Take a look at the lower control arms on the Magnum Force setup. The width right there, I'd put it about a maximum of eight inches, whereas over here, we only have it two or three inches. Now, one of the things on this front end that is, again, kind of taking the original wheel and making it better are these lower control arms. If you look at the width, the size, and the fact that it's an A-shaped lower control arm instead of the singular plane control arm on a Mopar, you can just see inherently that you're gonna have more strength. And you also have less things holding it in place like you don't need a strut rod. Every time you take pieces of linkage and components out and you tighten it up, it's gonna give you a better ride. And that's what that does. You know, at the end of the day, both of them have a place, right? If you're building a, a resto mod car, or maybe in some cases you just want a car like the ones we do where they call them resto mods, but it, it looks 100% like an original 1970 Roadrunner, but it's got the Magnum Force rack and pinion front suspension underneath it. I think that's a universe that's okay to have out there, and I think what we do is a universe too. What we're doing is we're continuing the original assembly line appearance of a car, and what he has to offer is the alternate universe of it. Now we can marry the two together like we did on the Superbird, like we did on the SEMA CUDA, like we've done so many times, and you can have the best of both worlds. The OG looking Mopar with the late model, quick ratio, like you're driving on rails, front suspension. In 1972, there are two models, both hardtops, the Challenger and the sports version, the Challenger Rally. And the sporty appointments of the Rally can be had with a standard 318 V8. A long hood, short deck, low height, personal car styling. Clean line, so popular with prospects according to Bill Mansell, had been retained, as you can see, in 1972. Overall length is just over 191 inches on a 110 inch wheelbase. Side windows are ventless with curved glass. Door handles are flush mounted, paddle type for easy operation. This car is equipped with optional style road wheels with chrome trim rings. Wheel lifts are tastefully trimmed in bright metal.
Okay, so the name of the game with the autopsy report is you want to give them all the data and giving them some, an idea of exactly what to expect from the scar and just how rare it is. But you gotta engage your audience. So the camera on the left, that's your lovemaking camera. Now one of the things that I've been doing just for our social media stuff is, I came up with this idea called an autopsy report. Now we used to, if you go back to a few seasons ago, we were doing a corpse of the week. This 1971 Dodge Charger RT is our corpse of the week. Now the 71 Charger was the first of the third generation Chargers. Some people love them, some people hate them. I personally think they're pretty cool. You could get a 440 Magnum, that was standard. You could order a 446 pack or a 426 Hemi. We're doing the same thing with an autopsy report, but it's line for line data plate breakdown. They do really well on, on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook stuff. So I know that people enjoy seeing them. My problem is I'm so busy, I can't do everything anymore. I was pioneering those things. I think it'd be a great bit for Alyssa. I wanted to talk to her about just grabbing the torch, the baton, whatever euphemism you want to use and taking that over because I think she'll do really well. You want to draw those people out of their home and put them in your home. Offer them a Diet Coke and turn on Motor Trend. The way you're gonna do that is through engaging them. So you gotta set the hook in the beginning. I was really happy my dad wanted me to start doing these autopsy reports for him. It's also a great experience for remembering sales codes and options, but in my dad's usual fashion, nothing is ever as it appears. Pretty cool. So part. I'll give you an example of what this is gonna look like. Okay. This 1969 Dodge Charger, 426 Hemi, four speed RT, 410 Super Track Pack is one of only 207 ever made. It also happens to be the subject of this week's <laughs> company report. She's just gonna need a little bit of coaching from the tray, Super Tray. By the way, I've changed my name to Super Tray from Ice Tray. So for those of you, hashtag Super Tray. And you do that at the end. What is that? That's, a, that's where you deliver it. I've been accused of being a showman. That's fine, I am. But I've also grew up in an era of showmen, all right? They don't have variety shows. We watch variety shows. We watch Carol Burnett show. You know, we, we grew up on that kind of stuff. So you gotta grab people's attention, right? That's the whole point. If you don't like that one, you can do it. I got yeah, a Give few me another of example. Things. I don't think I wanna do that one. That one was insane. And what happened to be the subject of this week's <laughs> Topsy Report. Well, what the was that? I grew up on old commercials. There's a TV commercial that never aired because it was banned about the guy that went off on his boss. I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen that. Ralph Williams, the owner of Bayshore at Price of Plymouth, 345 El Camino Real in the city of San Bruno. You notice the big bald-headed son of a <laughs> And when this bald-headed son of a <laughs> gets hold of you, you will spend money. They should have aired that. That got my attention. You can do the Is sensual it, one. And it happens to be the subject of this week's And for the record, I'm not gonna do any of those faces. I mean, I'm still young. I still have like a bright future ahead of me and a lot hopefully going on. So the last thing I need is to be locked up in like a mental institute. So not doing any of those faces. Well, and it happens to be the subject of this week's Yeah. Wait. Yeah. You don't say it out loud. Okay, so wait, wait. Can you just clear something up? So yeah. you're telling me that I either scream at the top of my lungs like a psychopath or I whisper it? Right. But there's other ones but too. And it also happens to be the subject of this week. <laughs> oh my God. You know, you're not ready to do this. We're going to go, no. To be an idiot? Here's the thing, if you're not getting your point across in the beginning, shift gears, right? It's and not being an idiot. That's crazy. Why don't you go look at how many people have viewed normal, them? Like, She's obviously not getting what I'm doing. She doesn't understand the context of it. She thinks I'm acting a fool, not realizing I'm just being a showman. So I want to see her what it looks like when it's all edited and put together. So I'm going to take her back to the shop and have her watch a few of those things. Give her a better idea, right? Pictures are a thousand words. There were very few changes between the 1972 to 1974 Challenger model years. And since we couldn't find an original promo film for 1973, we are using the 1972. The grill and fiberglass mounting panel is a carryover from 1972, which is painted the same as the body color. The Challenger Rally features strobe-type stripes on the sides. The model shown here has the dramatic rally hood scoop with removable fresh air plates. Both models have hidden windshield wipers. The most noticeable style change for 72 is, of course, the front end. The new high-style grille of the Challenger is argent silver 
The Challenger Rally is in black. If you're going out of your way to promote something and make something big, gotta get their attention, right? So like show boobs or something? I'm just trying to figure out what would be best for our audience. No, Boobie. not at all. Not at all. I don't want any of that. This is a family show, and I don't think any- It's a family show? You are humping something outside of this window. That was making oh, a no. point that you stand up against oppression. So, if I may, all right, so give this a second. This 1969 Dodge Super B, 383 four-speed, is the subject of this week's autopsy report. So that's kind of the, okay. the softer. You that's were not, crazier earlier. Let's do another one. 1970, in order for Plymouth to race at NASCAR with their all-new Superbird, they had to build two units for each dealership in the country. Thus, 1,920 Superbirds were built. This it. is one of those Superbirds. Right. It's also the subject of this week's autopsy report. Now, hey, see? that was great. Yeah. yeah. That was great. And now, change the channel. That was, that was, that was good. horrible. That was not that bad. That was the worst one I've ever done. Trust me, nobody wants to see boring. Nobody, all right? What do you, you, you know the show Cops, the reality show Cops? What's that, 50 years on TV? I don't know how long it is. It's because it's shock TV, it's thriller TV, it's get your attention TV. Nobody wants to see a cop pull some guy over, give him a ticket for speeding, and have the guy say, oh, thank you, officer, have a great day. Nobody wants to watch that. They want to see a guy jump out the passenger's window of a car that's still rolled up, jump on the hood, take a dump, and run off into the forest singing Sweet Caroline by Neil Diamond. That's good TV. Let me cue up the one I think that is best and it's going to get us the best reaction. Okay. In 1970, Dodge introduced the Challenger. Yes. One of those models was the Trans Am Trans Challenger. Challenger. T -A -A. 346 pack shows. engine that created 290 nice. horsepower. This is a four-speed car, and it happens to be this week's top report. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. That's insane. No, that's what that's you need ridiculous. to do because that's what no. gets people. No, Dad. that was one of the most highly watched autopsy reports I've ever done. I think we must be seeing something a little bit different. Um, um, I guarantee we're gonna see something a little bit different because my dad's lost his mind completely, especially if he thinks that's the way I'm gonna do it. Did you see what you did with your face? Yeah. Okay, look. Okay, you only got 2.2k <laughs> likes and only 201 shares. Absolutely. That's not, no, that's that fair good. to say. It's also got 56 comments in what three hours? I put it up three uh, hours ago. Dad, you freaking you put it up there April 6th. Well, that's not right. What do you mean? I'm giving Alyssa alternate facts. Okay, dates don't matter in alternate fact land. It's a fact. That's a real fact. You're dead to me. You don't need to chime in on anything, okay? A little tiny dancer back there being body double for old Sean Astin and Rudy. I saw the movie. In 1970, Dodge built exactly 1,443 Charger RTs. Interesting information. With a 440 Magnum good. and a four-speed four manual speed. transmission. Yeah. Boom, boom. This car is Jump one of those. Now watch. It's the subject of this week's ah! auction <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you go right into my silhouette, and, like in Psycho. Okay. Where you dad, see me. Um, coming back to the shop did not help me understand anything more than my dad is crazy, and I'm not doing it. This 1970 Dodge Challenger 440 four speed is one of only 916 made. It also happens to be the subject of this week's. <laughs> People are watching it because they're worried about you. I mean, he's completely gone. He's just, he's out there, I don't understand. Can we just do a normal do one? Do the other one where you look like you're about to go into a full flat line, then. That one that I did. <gasps> Top tier I can't. The apple fell really far from the tree. How about some trivia to see how many of you have been paying attention? On the 1973 Challenger Rally, what's the smallest engine you could get? Is it the 318, 340, or 383? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. Welcome back. Are you ready to see how right or wrong you are? On the 1973 Challenger Rally, What's the smallest engine you could get? If you guessed 318, then pat yourself on the back because you are correct. The rest of you should feel ashamed. 
In addition, once inside, a person could appreciate the personal car feel, the built-in comfort, convenience, its ample room. For example, the fine-crafted door panels with simulated wood grain inserts and flush-mounted door handles. Front seats are full foam buckets, all vinyl high back with integral head restraints and rich design. Available in blue, black, green, white, or gold. In 1970, Dodge made 847 Challenger RTs with a 446 pack and manual transmission. The most popular color for that car was FC7 Plum Crazy. It also happens to be the subject of this week's autopsy report. That's, that's a shame. So remember when we read a fender tag, we go left to right, bottom to top. The first code is E87. That means 390 horsepower and 446 pack. D21, that's heavy duty, four speed manual transmission. JS23, that represents that it's a Challenger and an RT model. V0B, V indicates that it's a 446 pack. Zero means it was a 1970 model year and B means it was built in Hamtramck, Michigan. 191280 means it's the serial number that's specific to this car. FC7 means it was painted plum crazy purple. H6X9 means it was built with bucket seats and they're all vinyl. 000 means it was built with a one piece door trim panel. B14 is its scheduled production date, which in this case means that was November 14th, 1969. 013665 is its shipping order number, and it only appeared in two places, on the broadcast sheet and the fender tag. V1X means it was built with a black vinyl top, A01 light group, A34 super track pack. That means it has the 410 Dana 60 rear axle. A62 means rally instrument gauges. B51 means it has power disc brakes. C55 indicates it has bucket seats. G33 means it has an outside left hand chrome mirror. J45 means it has hood tie down pins. M21 means it had drip rail moldings. N41 is dual exhaust. N42 is bright exhaust tips. N85 is tachometer. R35 is an AM FM radio. V6W is the white longitudinal stripes. Y05 means it was built to USA specifications. 26 means it had a 26 inch radiator. EN2 means that this is the end of the sales code and the end of this week's autopsy report. <laughs>